get started. I'm still hoping we might still have, have a couple more. Um, so David can record. Um, would we like to do a round of introductions or um, do, we, we, I, do we all know each other here? I think we know each other. Yeah. Yeah, I think we I think we do pretty pretty well. So we'll 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 just just start in. Um, but welcome to the to the May uh, Rhode Island Woodland Partnership meeting. I there's been a lot you know going on um, in, in our work. So we'll have a number of different updates uh, today, and uh, we'll have an opportunity for you know, discussion and you know and partner updates later. Um, but why not? Uh, start in right now with um, my co-coordinator, Kate Stales, uh, talking about the uh, Rhode Island Forest Health Works, uh, RCPP, and uh, a rundown on uh, the, the parts of that and what that means. Sure. So, hi, everybody. Um, we've had a lot of exciting news in the last couple weeks. Um, we received an announcement that we were awarded the we were awarded 4.4 million dollars out of the 5.6 million that we asked for for the forest health work pro um, project so that is the regional conservation partnership program application that we put in uh, through nrcs um, with dem as the head applicant nancy is here we actually sat down and had a meeting to sort of go through some of this yesterday um, I figured it'd be best if I just sort of went through and did like a whirlwind tour of what this whole program is supposed to be and then give you an update as to where we are. Um, so first, this whole opportunity, this whole grant um, program is for con the conservation of forest land statewide through acquisitions um, and easements. Uh, so NRCS is funding both the program delivery of these easements and capacity building for our partner organizations. Uh, local land trusts will act as the connectors as the making connections and engaging landowners and engaging local land trusts to um, get these easements on the ground. Um, and this was made possible by some robust partnership contributions um, and DEM staff will be overseeing and administrating and coordinating this project. So I figured um, things, so we didn't get the full ask of uh, over 5.6 million. It's changed to 4.4. And Nancy and I spent some time kind of looking at that yesterday. And without having met with NRCS yet, we don't really understand how we're supposed to reduce our partnership contributions um, or start to plan for that. So first I wanna just remind everybody about what our partner contributions are. Um, and what we've all sort of agreed to. And then I um, will sort of go over what the next steps are. So uh, our easements are related to entity held easements and uh, uh, government held easements. So for the entity held easements, um, organizations like land trusts who already have projects underway um, can receive the sort of cash funding that they need to make those deals happen. And we received 1 million uh, from DEM through that open space bond funding to match that, as well as 100,000 in the Situate Reservoir Watershed from Providence Water. So that's our, those are our cash matches. Um, we also have additional in-kind partner matches um, from TNC Audubon and the South Kingstown Land Trust. So TNC is uh, 2.5 million, Audubon's 1 million, and South Kingstown is 691,000. So those are the big ones. Those are uh, our partner organizations doing this good on the ground conservation work that they were already planning on doing it, uh, doing in general, and then allowing us to include that in this project, providing us with really um, the bolster that we need to, to get this funding. Um, and then we have all of our smaller partner organizations. Um, so DEM will be overseeing, administrating, and working on the outreach portion of this grant. Um, the district will, the Northern District will be working on coordinating and um, sort of the negotiation piece as, as well as the Rhode Island Land Trust Council will be working on the negotiation piece through the, um, through the NRCS process until we actually have agreements. 
Um, the Natural History Survey will be working on outreach and technical assistance, the Land Trust Council, Rhode Island Land Trust Council, technical assistance, and a platform for sort of the outreach approach. The Woodland Partnership, that's us. We are kind of a technical um, advisory board giving suggestions and uh, thoughts on ranking and how this project will go. The Rhode Island Forest Conservators Organization uh, will be um, using their already crafted success, landowner succession program uh, for this project. So we can really help some of those landowners who might be on the fence about thinking about their future and the future of their land to kind of give them the resources and the push over um, so that we can get some of those applications in. So you all know about as much information as I do. We were awarded the $4.4 million, hooray. Um, but we have not started our negotiations and the negotiations happen in two parts. The first part is the programmatic partnership agreements. So that's where uh, Nancy Sayers and myself will be meeting with NRCS to sort of talk with them about what everyone agrees to and uh, discuss the final scope of this project, who's responsible for what, how reporting will happen, all that stuff. And then we work on supplemental partner agreements. So those are the agreements that allow our partners to be paid for this work um, for, and for some of these easements to go through. Um, NRCS, sorry, my dog is eating kibble, if that's what you hear in the background, that, those little clinks. Um, it, DEA, our NRCS has a little more funding for their technical assistance with getting a lot of these easements done. So we're well positioned with Joe Bashan as the easement coordinator for the state of Rhode Island and all of his wealth and, of knowledge and how to get these easements done on the NRCS side. So we, he has a little extra funding to do that, the transactional work. Um, and we'll be working with Joanne Rigitelli uh, to get some of those transactions done, done and build capacity on the land trust side. So that is sort of the overview. Um, I think that the, the goal uh, based on the sort of webinar, Nancy also went to a webinar <laughs> two weeks ago to sort of understand the ins and outs and the complications of this program. And it seems like we'll be starting to accept applications for easements once we kind of all work on this criteria, maybe in January 2022. So it's going to take some time. Um, it's good that we recognize that this is just the first step in this process. Um, we're hoping it's not as complicated as the current um, project that the conservation districts are working on. Um, their RCPP from last year. Uh, I think that the way that we wrote it and submitted it and put it together uh, lends itself to make it a little easier, but, but these things are complicated in the government. So we're gonna do our best. Um, we also internally as a group of stakeholders have the opportunity to influence how these projects are ranked. So we wrote this based on um, some resource concerns, some water, uh, land protection for water quality, connectivity for wildlife habitat. Um, so we as a group get to decide what would give applicants and projects more of a boost. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. We will need to come together on that in the future. Um, we aggregate applications and I, again, this is still all big picture with no finality as to how this works. But we collect, it works in the same way as NRCS does, where we collect applications over a certain period of time. We put them through the ranking criteria that we have the ability to assist in creating. And then we rank and fund projects based on our allocation and based on um, you know, highest and best use of the funds essentially. So I think that that's, the the quick and messy overview it's really exciting i believe we can do an awful lot even with a reduction of a like a million and a half dollars with with only 4.4 million i still think we're going to get an awful lot of projects on the ground um there's a lot of excitement surrounding this and i'm excited so i'm happy to answer some of your questions 
Um, Nancy and I sat and uh, one of the awesome things that Nancy started working on yesterday was thinking about internally how to make outreach materials that would be useful um, beyond the scope of this project um, for things like succession planning and for easements in general materials um, that would be helpful to landowners um, and outreach materials. So we're hoping that all of our um, big picture dreams are funded and everything goes awesome. Hooray. <laughs> I have a question, uh, Kate. Sure. Uh, first, congratulations. Uh, that that it, it all sounds incredibly exciting, it really does. Well, congratulate Nancy, it's DEM's uh, grant. Well, congratulations, uh, Nancy. And I didn't you. write it, Kate wrote it. <laughs> you know, we're just along for the ride. We'll just both take credit and be quiet. All right, so, <laughs> so uh, that there's already a, a set of criteria for um, land acquisition in the state of Rhode Island. How different will this be, or do you know at this point between that that list of criteria and what might this and what this might look like. Yeah. So as D as DEM is providing us open space funding um, for lo the local working um, lands, forests, or well, I don't Rupert. What was it called again specifically in the open space bond? Working lands. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we have one million of the three million in working lands, um, and I think that this program benefits the work that Michelle Sheehan does with farmland um, and open space easements because there weren't necessarily criteria for forest um, for forest easements. So we get to work together to design that criteria, I will say. I believe we're going to, because we're receiving funding from DEM specifically, we'll follow um, the guidelines that they've already sort of established as a baseline and then go from there. Thank you. Yeah. And we've done a little bit of background work to put out the feelers about landowners or land trusts that are interested or that have projects ready. Um, when we were writing this grant, clearly we didn't have the capacity or time to like have a, a full comprehensive list of all the lands we want to protect with these funds. But I think that through our um, institutional knowledge, working together, working with our land trust partners um, and the landowners that we know who are already interested, we're gonna have a pretty robust list statewide of folks. It, there's there's scoring cr criteria for the Forest Legacy Program too that'll really inform this. It's been used for a number of years, so. What yeah. are the priorities for the RCPP in terms of some, some forest land over others? We get to create those. It's a statewide project. So okay. the only money that is specifically like earmarked or whatever is the $100,000 specific to the Situate Reservoir Watershed. So if right. we do get those, if we do get some applications in that project area, um, Providence Water will match those specific projects with cash. Okay. Um, we focused an awful lot of projects in that area. And we have a lot of legacy applications and we have a lot of um, Southern New England Heritage Forest, um, Healthy Forest Reserve applications. So there's uh, a lot of activity up there already. Um, so we'll see what happens. But that's the only specifically designated funding. So the uh, criteria for this RCPP, except for the Situate Reservoir Watershed, haven't been developed yet, is that? Is no, that right? nope. So the way ranking works for NRCS, there's national questions, there's state questions, and there's local questions. We have no influence on the national questions. Um, all of our partner organizations have an influence on the state questions. And actually, we have a local working group meeting coming up mm -hmm. in a few weeks that I can send you some information on. Uh, it's always great for our local partners to show up at these meetings to say out loud to NRCS, we think that these things are important. Um, so that is the state ranking criteria. And then we internally work with NRCS to decide the local ranking criteria. So that is our, mm -hmm. um, our influence. And then another question, there's not a complimentary equip 
conservation practices part of this RCPP, is that right? No, so um, Healthy Forest Reserve as a easement program exists nationally, but we have not had a funding allocation in Rhode Island. This isn't equipped, this is um, an, a specific easement program. Yeah. Um, and the, the entity held easement portion of this project is modeled after the ALE program, which is essentially like what NRCS does for farmland conservation easements. So um, it's, we're not recreating an NRCS wheel. We're just bring, bringing funding specifically to forest land conservation. Um, there is some equip funding for forest landowners who do not currently have a forest management plan. We're gonna keep that as a requirement because with uh, perpetuity easements, we do wanna see some management. Um, I'm gonna guess, and maybe this is a wrong guess, but I'm gonna guess most of the landowners that we are gonna work with have forest management plans. Um, and that is one of the things I wanna sort of negotiate with NRCS. There might be an opportunity to pull some of that equip funding out and stick it back into easements if we're creative about it, uh, especially because if those landowners apply for equip, um, you, when you're applying for a plan, you most like, like almost 100% get funded or 100%. You need a plan to do anything else. So. Gotcha. So start, start those wheels turning. Make your list of all those properties. It, they, they're, they're spinning out of control. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's not a bad thing. And thanks to everyone for, you know, all, all of the awesome work that went into this. David, Rupert, Nancy, Joanne, sitting down and repeatedly our super team, weekly meeting, trying to sort this out. Um, we did it, so that's cool. And that's uh, it for me, I think, unless you have any other questions. Nice. Congratulations again. Thanks. To, to everyone. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing how it develops as it as it rolls out, comes into focus more. Well, uh, we can move on to our next topic, which is an update on the uh, Oak Resiliency Grant um, and getting you into, into a bit of a preview on the Oak Resiliency Assessment Tool. Uh, and that'll be me. I'm just going to, I'll pull up some uh, PowerPoint slides and roll through a presentation on that and we'll really be interested in your, you know, input um, on the Oak Resiliency, you know, the, the tool in particular, which is nearing the end of its development, but there's still room to get some, some tweaks and changes in. So um, here we go. All right, just need to maximize that again. All right, so um, just an update on the you know, recent uh, parts of this grant, um, which is a three-year project. Uh, it's focused on the southern New England states of you know Connecticut, Rhode Island, and, and Massachusetts. This is going to be you know review for some of you. Um, it's funded through the Forest Services uh, Landscape Scale. Uh, restoration grant program. Uh, the Forest Stewards Guild is the lead partner. Well, the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experimentation Station um, is doing a lot of the work on the um, demonstration and you know researchy uh, components of it. And then the three state agencies, uh, including uh, Rhode Island DEM, are core partners as well. And uh, when it comes to the outreach part of the grant, we're trying to reach both foresters and the other professionals who work with them uh, and landowners as well. So it's a sort of two-pronged approach. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of different partners uh, over the tri-state landscape that are involved with this project. Um, you know, some of them, are, you know, right here in the, in the meeting, um, you know, those that are in bold here are, are taking on a somewhat larger role. And, you know, we're, undertaking this because our oak forests have been seeing challenges um, that are becoming increasingly apparent. Um, you know, probably getting the most you know, public attention is the gypsy moth uh, infestation in the late teens in which you saw you know, de defoliation um, over several successive years that led to 
widespread canopy mortality in some areas, particularly along the, uh, the western towns of Rhode Island up against the Connecticut border, and then in eastern Connecticut and up into south central um, Massachusetts. Um, I believe there is an estimate that uh, Rhode Island lost about 15% you know, of its forest canopy um, due to that. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the high you know, deer populations and the pressure that they're um, putting on the ability of forests to regenerate themselves because they like, you know, nibbling on the, the saplings uh, in, in shoots. In a, you know, densely populated area, uh, you know, we have a lot of invasive plant issues. And then there are also, you know, pathogens, and diseases that are coming in. We've had some significant droughts in recent years as well. Uh, and all of these stressors you know, interact with climate change that we're uh, coming to understand more and is, is um, becoming a bigger and bigger factor. And then it can also be a tough social environment for practicing forestry. Um, again, in a densely populated landscape um, where there's not a legacy of working the land in some you know, rural parts of the region like there used to be, uh, you know, certainly public foresters in Connecticut and Massachusetts uh, in particular have been um, under scrutiny from the pro-forestation movement, for example. So, uh, you know, landowners, you know, you know, private landowners are, uh, you know, critical to our success in working on this landscape. Um, folks like these, because in states like Rhode Island, they control, you know, two thirds of the forest land, but you have um, about 38,000 different private landowners and, you know, collectively uh, their decisions will have a huge impact on the landscape. So our ability to um, influence and, and work with them is important to the future of uh, the oak forest. Oops, going the wrong way. So uh, to involve landowners, you know, back in the winter of 2020 before COVID, uh, we had a number of town hall style sessions around the region like this is a photo from one in Belchertown, Mass. Uh, we were trying to get the pulse of landowners, uh, find out what they were concerned about, um, what they would like to uh, get help on, uh, you know, what their questions were and so forth. And this was with the intention of uh, developing events for the field season of 2020, where we had all kinds of, um, you know, ideas for woods walks and tours, landowner forums, and, you know, trying to foster, you know, connections amongst landowners. But, of course, the pandemic uh, came along, and um, it was a, a big change of plans there, as it was for, for all of us in not being able to gather in person as we'd intended to do. Um, and you're familiar with all of that. Um, you know, lucky not to have a larger you know, disruption as, as of course many people did. So, you know, the effect of this for this grant was that a lot of the outreach activities um, moved to an online format, in particular uh, webinars, uh, which some of you may have participated in, started out with uh, one that was, you know, really focused um, on reaching foresters and professionals in general and helping them with their, you know, communications tools and being able to speak with landowners in a way that they can relate to, not, you know, go right into the forestry jargon um, and trying to um, show understanding and, you know, empathy for their motivations, basically. This is, you know, based on the techniques for engaging landowners effectively principles. Uh, since, you know, landowners are so important, um, we thought we'd um, sort of flip the usual model and give landowners a chance to talk about what it's like to work with foresters, you know, loggers and so forth, um, and taking care of their land. We heard from a, a really active couple who own property in Pomfret, Connecticut, uh, and that was a, um, a lively presentation indeed. I uh, did have another um, landowner town hall back in February of this year, uh, which was an interesting one because it enabled <clears throat> landowners, you know, from around the region, of course, to take, you know, part uh, given the online format. So you didn't have the <clears throat> usual groups of people who, you know, who all know each other um, and, and go to these types of events. Um, you had the opportunity for some new interactions and it led to a um, production of a digital, you know, question and answer document, which I think is a nice looking document 
um, and some of you may be interested in distributing it to landowners you work with. And then most recently, there was a webinar series, um, you know, focusing on, you know, three particular aspects uh, of oak forests, um, you know, wildlife issues with Brian Hawthorne of Mass Wildlife, uh, forestry and silviculture uh, with our own fern graves, um, Rhode Island DEM, and then Andrea Urbano of uh, Connecticut Deep uh, spoke to, you know, climate change and adaptation topics. And, uh, recordings uh, of all these um, are available on the Forest Stewards Guild's website, um, along with some of the, uh, the documents that accompany them. So another um, significant component of the great grant that's been um, a bit slow in coming is the Oak Resiliency Assessment Tool, uh, which is something that's uh, intended, you know, for foresters and also some, some landowners, you know, who have experience in managing their land. This might be, you know, folks who've been through the coverts program, who've had uh, NRCS contracts, who are, you know, leaders with land trusts, um, you know, for example, so have some, you know, comfort and familiarity with stewardship there. Uh, to make it accessible to as many people as possible, uh, it has a, a, a web-based interface. You're basically going to go to a, a website to access it. You'll, you'll see what that looks like in a moment. And in addition to the Guild, uh, we've been working with the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Co Cooperative, um, which has you know, become a, a lot more active uh, in, in Southern New England. And uh, you know, they have the programming skills in-house to be able to develop a tool like this. So we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Then the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science, or NIACS, also got involved um, because they are interested in using the model and being able to expand it uh, and use it for tools and other ecosystems. Uh, so it's you know, really looking at um, trying to assess the vulnerability of a forest property or site uh, and its capacity to adapt, which are two related but slightly different things. And then it'll give you some, some possible avenues or approaches for management, um, but the intention is, is not to be prescriptive, um, to not to um, to try to take the forester's role. So I'll jump in for a quick tour now. Um, and these are some uh, mock-ups of the tool. Uh, some of them are a bit you know, dated now as, as it evolves, but they're the best, best I have. Uh, but you'll see that there's some you know, filler text on some of these slides. You'll come to this uh, landing page where there'll be a bit of information about the tool, uh, video to provide some background on it and some key contacts. And then you can um, jump in and start uh, the assessment. And here, um, you know, we're trying to get a, a sense of, you know, who's going to be using the tool. So, you know, we anticipate most of the people will be foresters, landowners, you know, possibly some students. And then this tool collects data, and we do want people to be able to test it, try it out, and kick the tires. But that data doesn't need to be saved. Um, you know, compared to those who are really, you know, carrying out a full assessment. Um, we do uh, want to retain that. So what, that's what these questions are getting at. Um, and then there's an opportunity to enter some information um, about the property or the site that you're working on and, you know, upload some photos. We thought that this could help, um, you know, personalize it for landowners who are using it. And at the end, it'll also generate a report uh, that you know could be included as an appendix with a forest management plan, for example. Uh, so we wanted to give users the opportunity to produce something that um, that looks nice, something that you might you know want to pick up and read uh, at the end. And then it also gathers a bit of information about uh, where the property is located. There are three different ways to, to enter it. Um, and the intent of, of this is to, to, as, to be able to discern as, as there are more users of the tool, you know, are there patterns that start, you know, emerging across the region? Or are there, are there trends that would be helpful, you know, for, for uh, professionals, you know, working for the state agencies, for example, to know, uh, or that could be passed back to users? Um, now we're really getting into the, uh, the core of the, of the assessment. But there are um, a series of 
different questions on, um, we're starting with site impacts here. And, you know, the users asks to, you know, position, you know, whether you think you're, you know, low risk or high risk, you know, for each of these issues. So these are just a couple of examples of, you know, what's going to be a list of 10 or more questions. But for increases in extreme precipitation events, you know, would a property be particularly vulnerable to erosion and flooding or so forth or not? Or, you know, how about higher sea levels? Well, that, you know, may be an issue um, you know, with increasing storms or associated effects for properties in, in places like Tiverton, Little Compton, or um, South Kingstown, you know, less so in, in Foster or Burrowville. And we wanted to give users the op option to, you know, check the I'm not sure box, for, you know, particularly for landowners. Um, or you know, folks who might be less familiar with um, particular issues. And then <clears throat> just as uh, you know, we have, have for site impacts, there are also these you know, questions about adaptive capacity uh, on the forest property or the site uh, you know, where you're working. Uh, is there you know, a range of you know, species uh, diversity and um, you know, vegetation at different canopy levels, for example. Uh, you know, how severe are the deer impacts? And you can imagine, uh, you, know, you know, how some of these questions will continue on. I think it'll be a, you know, a, t a total of, you know, between 20 or 30 uh, for the two of them. But it's, it's these, these screens where the landowner is providing most of the input for the tool. So then the tool, you know, crunches the numbers and it's going to come, come back and give you a site vulnerability assessment that's going to look something, something like this, uh, though this has been, you know, updated a bit. And you'll see sort of where your site, you know, falls, uh, you know, when you sort of plot it on a graph of, you know, impacts versus adaptive capacity. So you can get a sense of how, you know, vulnerable um, or resilient your, your site is. Um, and then it's going to try to point you towards some information about how you, how you, you could consider managing it, given that information. <clears throat> Under the score feedback, I don't think we're going to have uh, those numeric scores, because um, this is you know, too imp imprecise to make empirical comparisons between properties. Um, but will give you a um, site assessment like medium or high or, or low. Um, there'll be you know, links to issues of consideration have, that have come up that you could learn more about. Um, severe storms, carbon, invasive species, for example. We'll take a look more at those in the moment and then suggest some uh, management path midways that a landowner or forester might be interested in pursuing we're still looking for a, an icon that um, sort of captures the risk and reward of, of different options that you is intuitive uh, when you see it immediately. So here's the page, uh, one page for possible management approaches. And this follows the resistance, resilience, uh, transition um, pathways that the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science uh, developed for forest climate adaptation. So this is a screen for resistance, which is the most conservative uh, approach in which you're trying to, you know, protect the existing conditions for uh, as long as, as you can and, and trying to ward off change. Um, you know, there's some links to on the ground examples that could be relative uh, or relevant to your project. And then it links to some NRCS conservation practices too, since that's such an important uh, funding source for private landowners um, in particular. And then here's an example of the screen or, uh, for one resource issue, for which it's trying to connect the user with more information. Uh, I think we'll ultimately have a different you know, photo for invasive species, but once again, trying to provide some links to examples of different projects 
uh, inner CS conservation practices that would be relevant to addressing this issue. Uh, and then, you know, how climate change can um, be a variable and play into the management avenues that you might pursue. So, um, as we finish up work um, on, the, on this tool, there are going to be a couple of oak resiliency assessment workshops, uh, which is we're going we're to roll this out and give people a chance to play with it. Um, I think the first one's going to be coming up in July. It'll be a, a hybrid event, meaning you can come in, in person or, or, you know, or, or be at home to you know, roll out and introduce people uh, you know, to the tool. And then we had thought about uh, you know, doing a, um, an online event this past winter to try to bring you know, foresters and you know, wildlife biologists uh, to, together. Uh, but I think it re would really be beneficial to be able to, to do that in person. So that's been pushed ahead uh, to, to next winter uh, where they were hoping to be able to do that um, in-person workshop. And you know, we're looking for common ground on deer impact monitoring and solutions. And we know this is a tough issue. Some of the, the conversations for this part of the grant really started with the Woodland Partnership. And we know that we're not gonna uh, solve it, uh, but we do you know, want to try to move the needle uh, and have some useful outputs uh, over the last uh, couple of years of the grant. So hope that um, some of you can participate in these workshops um, and try out the tool as well, particularly if you're one of the members who spends time working in the woods. And speaking of the woods, we are um, looking forward to getting back out there, starting to think about uh, organizing some you know, outdoor uh, uh, events again for natural resource professionals and landowners. We're not sure just exactly what this is going to look like right now. When I put this slide together, I, I figured, you know, it would look like this with masks and social distancing and size limits and, and probably, you know, some of this will be in effect. But uh, as you're all well aware, uh, the landscape on um, best practices and, and vaccination and what people are doing with, with COVID is uh, evolving rapidly. So we'll, we'll be, um, you know, we'll be using our best judgment there like everyone else. So that um, brings me to the end, but uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share an update on the grant and interested in any thoughts or input you might have or questions, um, particularly on the Oak Resiliency uh, tool as we um, look to finish that up and get it out to you all. Thanks. Just to add, Christopher, uh, that uh, to all that the study portion in Rhode Island is going to happen at the Decapita State, which I think some of you are familiar with, but DM is moving towards that being our research platform, forestry related. So we want to see, uh, bring out the value of Decapit. We've already uh, arranged for several acres of that site to serve as a reach for research platform. And I think we just got some deer fencing up there as well as part of this study. So that's where this uh, study will be conducted in Rhode Nice, that's, that's great. There'll be, be a lot going on at Tecapit. I'll talk about the, um, the other grant sort of project um, when we get into our updates. Anybody else have any uh, questions? Uh, or if you would uh, like to be an early user of the tool, uh, I know we've, we've got a few people from the partnership already on the list. Feel free to yeah, reach out to me and can keep you posted on that. Thanks. I think we can shift to the policy part of the meeting now and um, we have a member of the Woodland Partnership on Governor McKee's transition team, uh, fortunate in that regard. And Paul, why don't you uh, bring us up to speed on uh, what's happening there, um, particularly as it relates to, to forests and natural resources. Are you all set with sharing, Paul? 
Um, yes, yeah, I, I will okay. in a minute. Yep, I will. Yeah, and and we'll see if it works. Uh, thank, thanks, Christopher, and thanks everyone for putting me on your agenda for today. So starting way back in March, I think it was March 9th of this year, a call went out to about, I don't know, almost 50 folks all throughout Rhode Island, asking them if they're interested in participating in these um, meetings, uh, week, uh, weekly meetings that would uh, help uh, Governor McKee uh, in his uh, quest to, uh, to get, get the, the ball rolling on certain areas, certain projects, certain issues. And the issues ranged from everything from uh, affordable housing to transportation, to healthcare, certainly COVID-19 early on, it was on the vaccination uh, protocols and programs. And there was a, there is a section called energy and environment. And since then uh, we've been meeting uh, I shouldn't say weekly. Uh, it, it initially started off weekly. Now it's every two weeks or so. And uh, there's another one happening in about uh, three hours from now. Uh, the idea is to come up with some policy recommendation or areas or focus areas that the, the new governor and his team can, can work on. Each one of these groups, each one of these sections, housing, transportation, et cetera, has a, a staff member from the governor's office for the energy and environment. Uh, some of you may know uh, Victoria Scott. Uh, Victoria Scott is our uh, liaison and our moderator for this particular group. And uh, the group uh, functions as a focus group uh, with uh, ideas that, that get floated around and then recommendations on, on how best to move those issues or those recommendations forward. And over the, the past, uh, since March, and I'll share my screen now with and show you just of, of very few of them. Uh, we've been coming, we've, we are uh, able to get on a, a Google Doc um, along with uh, uh, the, the Zoom meetings that we have and list those things that we think are important. And then over the course of, of the weeks, uh, flesh them out a little bit more. So for example, and I'll go through this very quickly and then give you an update as to where we are right now. For example, we, uh, the, the, I, I should say also that there are about 12 members on this energy and environment group. And I'll show you the the, the list of people though, although that list has changed and I'll show it to you at the end of this list. And they include some uh, town uh, municipal town council members, a few lobbyists. Uh, I think I might be the only quote unquote env environmentalist on, on, the, uh, on, on our particular group. And there, there are other members of the community, community both in uh, not the nonprofit and the for-profit sector. So we have talked about, and again, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, we've talked about the uh, Aquinnick Island uh, 2019 gas shortage, what's happening with the national grid. We've talked about uh, pollution in the bay and the harbor. And you may see at the end of some of these uh, first names, uh, uh, and usually this fir these first names apply to someone who has actually recommended this particular uh, policy or, or focus. Uh, bottle bill, we talked about uh, perhaps Rhode Island finally should have, better have, hurry up and have a bottle bill. Uh, we've talked about Biden's executive order 14008 and the idea of uh, 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the United States and offshore to be preserved by 2030. We've talked about increasing the capacity of, of Rhode Island DEM, uh, what I will talk about today and I'll mention it now and a little bit later as an update. 
uh, I, I think the focus now is on pooling resources together from other state agencies, as well as places like the Rhode Island Woodland Partnership and, not, and other nonprofits, grassroots organizations, uh, pool those efforts together to actually think through projects, come up with a recommended policy and put that policy before the General Assembly. But early on, we talked about uh, getting ready for Biden, the executive orders. Uh, composting has come up. And since uh, talking with uh, folk, folks from the composting and food waste management uh, sector, uh, we, we are uh, slowly uh, coming up with a, and I, I think this will be one of the recommended policies, some type of recommendation on how to proceed with managing our food waste in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we've also talked about um, tipping fees. Uh, municipalities have talked a lot about this, especially those who are on the town council or have been members of the town council. Uh, uh, we've also brought up uh, the inclusion of state-sponsored land acquisition programs and, and putting that uh, into uh, as, as a line item in state budgets. Um, uh, things like National Grid uh, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, substation uh, uh, capacity and how some of the major players are using up all the capacity within a substation. Uh, and that pretty much disallows or uh, eliminates any other program such as community-based solar, even some of the rooftop solars, uh, solar projects. Uh, for example, I live in a community, uh, I live in a circle here, and we would, we have, if we all did um, rooftop solar, we would uh, still be able to put uh, whatever excess capacity we have onto the substation that's that connects to this, this mile circle. Uh, there are many communities throughout Rhode Island that do not have that ability any longer because the major players have, have uh, siphoned off all of the capacity from the substation. Uh, we've also talked about um, giving access to uh, landlords and landladies and, and uh, rental properties to get access to some of those uh, solar project funds or energy efficiency programs. Uh, right now, they're, they're uh, not able to get on there because they're considered a business. And uh, that there was a, a good discussion. I think this will be one of the one of the five or six projects that we talk about as well. Um, I'll move I'll move on to uh, what I think uh, are, are some projects that um, that should be uh, of interest here. And there are some here and there, and there are some that are not here yet. Uh, we, we have talked about uh, the Forest uh, uh, Conservation Act that uh, Scott Millar and others have put through the uh, General Assembly. We did talk early on about the Act on Climate Bill and asked the governor to get on board with that. That was a, a direct ask because that uh, that could not wait uh, because of legislative action. So I'll, I'll stop there in, in terms of what we've talked about to date. To give you some idea of some of the members who are on this committee, and, I, and again, I'll go through this very, very quickly. Some of these names I'm sure you will recognize right away and, and some uh, may, be, may be new. Uh, we've we've gained uh, individuals uh, some uh, a few more than than what appears here, and uh, we've we've lost one or two, so it's a it's a process that's in flux. I'll stop the screen share for now. What uh, what seems to be the end result of all of this is a series of five to six recommendations that would go before the governor that would be championed by Victoria Scott. And, and that's been our, uh, the way we've been operating ever since our March 9th uh, introduction to all of this. So uh, in terms of 
what is going to go on there. Uh, there will be something about food waste. There will be something about uh, 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 energy efficiency and, and capacity on substations. There will be a recommendation to get land acquisition policy uh, uh, funding within a state budget. Um, I've asked uh, both Kate and uh, Rupert uh, for some other information on how best to move that issue. Uh, I'm looking to all of you to uh, supply if you can type something or if there's something that's important to you, please, please send that. Uh, along with those three or four, there's, uh, uh, there's the issue of, uh, of supporting the uh, Forest uh, of Conservation Act. And, and I, I can't remember the, the, the fifth, oh, uh, uh, I'll remember it in a second. But, but there, are, there are a few others as well. Uh, what, what will happen is we, I believe we have four or five more meetings uh, that'll get us to about June 19th, which is the end, end date of all of this. So about a month from now, uh, those, those issues policies will be uh, written in a, uh, a, a white paper type of format. Um, I am hoping and I've suggested to the uh, group of people that I be the one who writes it. Uh, th this is typical of any, any organization or any uh, grassroots uh, um, a type of committee that uh, issues policies or recommendations that one of the members of the of the working group uh, helps write or writes the the the, uh, the uh, white paper. So I've I've recommend I've asked if I could do that, and so far nobody has nobody has complained. So I'm I'm hoping to to take that on on near the end. Um, the, the other thing that seems to be um, a focus is, is, is getting uh, stakeholder input from other organizations. So I've mentioned uh, uh, Round Woodland Partnership. I've mentioned some of the River Watershed Councils. Um, I've talked with uh, Rody Gold. Uh, I've talked with a number of other people in, in different capacities uh, to try to get a coalition uh, that once this document is written, that it gets circulate, circulates to all of these stakeholders for both review and we hope for approval. Uh, it may not satisfy everything. Uh, it, may, it may not uh, uh, apply directly, but things like uh, 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 state la uh, land acquisition, uh, uh, energy uh, efficiency programs, uh, those types of things, I think, I hope, can be universally accepted. Uh, hopefully by, uh, I think our goal was, I forget what that, when the 100 days ends, let's see, January, February, March, it, it ends sometime around June. So hopefully by the end of the June, this thing will be written and submitted. So that's, uh, that's the update and, and that's uh, the, the brief uh, history of what is going on with this, with this uh, group. Uh, I, will, I, I, I do know that the other groups, uh, it, it seems to be a very active bunch of uh, emails have been flying around. I, I, all the, I every once in a while get something from the housing folks, from the transportation folks, a lot of good discussion. Uh, there's been a lot of good interest in, in getting this out. Uh, this is a very interesting way, I think, to, to help a, a, a new governor, a, a particularly a sitting governor, uh, with recommended policies. So I, I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, ask for both your support and your help, uh, particularly on the forest side of this and land acquisition, land acquisition side of it and uh, uh, to open up the floor to any questions. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Larry, go ahead. I have to unmute. So do you think that um, <clears throat> this Forest Conservation Act is a high priority, will be a high priority for Governor McKee, as it seems to be with some of the members of our legislature? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know, uh, 
I've, I've talked about it quite a bit, uh, both publicly and privately with Victoria Scott, and particularly since it is a piece of legislation that already is in uh, both the House and the Senate, that perhaps we shouldn't wait till the end of this process and, and writing a paper and circulating it. And, you know, by then, who knows? Uh, we the, do have a brief update from Scott Millar on that too, that we can give you after we're done yeah. with this Q and A. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, I, uh, to answer you the question, uh, the, the, uh, Victoria is, and, and I think she understands the importance of it. Uh, how far it gets up the, the chain, I don't know. Maybe the update will, from Kate will, will answer that question. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, have you found them generally, you know, receptive to including forests on the agenda, or you have you had to really fight to keep that in there? Yeah, it's a fight. It really is a battle, uh, even with in places like um, uh, Gloucester. Uh, can't remember the gentleman's name, but he's a former municip municipal town councilman. Uh, Buster Buster Steer Buster Steer. Yeah, even with Buster Steer, uh, it was a struggle to, um, uh, he's a developer too, so the, the, the forests get in the way of a, of a development uh, for him. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, it's, it, I, I, I think what will happen, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my uh, opinion, that, uh, that if, I, if I'm allowed to to at least write a draft, uh, I'll, I'll get that in as, uh, as one of the five items, both the uh, forest conservation and the land acquisition part of it. And then um, I'm, I'm gonna work with Kate and Rupert on this, uh, this uh, land acquisition thing and, and make, it, make it as high a priority as I can. Amanda? This is sort of off the forest topics, but it's related to climate change. Um, and I apologize if you said it, I got kicked off for quite a while. Um, the, I'm interested in the food waste portion of that because that's a big contributor to climate change. Were there, were there tie-ins there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really big deal. And, uh, and, and um, yeah, I, I didn't think, it, I, I, I knew it was a big deal, but after talking with the folks uh, from um, uh, Rody Gold, it, it really is a big, it's mostly institutional waste, food waste. So the hospitals, the schools, even the state agency cafeterias, the, the little ones, uh, restaurants uh, comes in the, into the picture. You put that all together and 90% of it just ends up in the Johnson landfill. Uh, very little of it goes anywhere else. And th there, there are problems associated with the consistency, uh, content, uh, 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 actual composition of it. Is it, is it pureed? Is it ground up? Is it liquefied? Is it solid? Uh, there are a whole bunch of issues. So I think the answer to, to that food waste problem is, is for the governor to issue a, a task force because we, we, and we're running out of, we, we don't have any capacity at the Johnson landfill and nobody in the state of Rhode Island wants a, a landfill in their backyard. And if you do, please let me know because I'd like to buy the property right away. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think again that the only way to solve it, there, there's no, there's no short-term uh, solution at all in the state of Rhode Island. Zero. Uh, the only long-term solution, and this is more like five or ten years out, is to get this task force, get, get it both on the nonprofit side, the, the for-profit side, the state agency side, do a. Do, do a kind of a, a stakeholders group like, like we established something here with the Rowland Woodland Partnership and tackle it and then come up with a series of answers that there's not going to be any one answer. Paul? I don't, know if, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Paul, a good corporate partner and that topic would be Cox Communications. They are very proud of their corporate facility where they have a dige food digester and you know the zero waste that comes out of that and uh, a few years ago they were kind of trumpeting that and uh, so I know lots of times in politics a corporate example is 
listened to more than the not-for-profit sector. So yeah, maybe a make a note that Cox Communication might be a good ally there. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was sort of thinking about whether or not um, there would be a push to quantify the climate change impact since it is such a big contributor and we're looking at these um, big goals and it seems like um, just over and over again the conversation about climate change um, goes back to renewable energy and there are so many other pieces where we could be working hard to make big gains and that's definitely one of them. The, the one, the one um, opportunity and bright spot of these conversations has been a willingness for small projects uh, to develop small projects, uh, community-based, individual, town, municipal, nonprofit, but to do small projects, manageable projects where the, where the, uh, the state would either offer guidance or money or federal money or something you know, cookie sales, anything uh, to get some money and then do these small projects. No, no one's going to get a shovel and build a seawall, uh, at least nobody in my neighborhood. Actually, there is a guy down here who does seawalls. So um, he might, but the rest, it's more like rain barrels, comp, backyard composting, planting trees, urban forestry management, uh, uh, you know, taking, uh, adopt a spot, uh, those types of, of things, I, I think, uh, at least on the on the municipal side, on the state side, I, I still think there is a, 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 a good opportunity for getting the Forest Conservation Act passed, uh, getting some of these focus groups, these uh, uh, stakeholder groups uh, enacted and supported by the, 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 the current governor. And, and for, uh, uh, for some uh, other uh, enabling legislation or, or legislation that would give existing uh, uh, state agencies the power to do things. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Paul. Fortunate to have the partnership member serving on the committee active on so many fronts. Well, uh, we'll turn our attention to the Forest Conservation Act. Uh, Kate, do you wanna pass along Scott's sure. um, update just, to start? We can throw I'm it gonna out. pull up the email and just give you the highlights if that's okay. So, um, so the chair of the House Environment Committee, Representative Bennett uh, likes the bill and wants to have it voted out of committee, um, is looking for support from all of the committee members, Ryan Mulcahy from DEM um, and Scott have been trying to meet with Representative Knight from the House Environment Committee. Um, let's see. He's been busy and had a few concerns, so they're trying to meet with him to address those. Um, Representative Speakman, the sponsor, said she'd like to see the bill pass the House Environment Committee as soon as possible. Um, that committee hasn't met in at least two weeks. We know the Senate also likes the bill and plans to vote it out of the Senate Environment and Agricultural Committee, so not sure when that will be. Um, trying to avoid any amendments to the bill since that would require a new vote by the House and Senate. Ryan has been helpful and it's clear DEM is doing all it can to move the bill forward. There's not much else we can do but wait for the House and Senate to act. So that's pretty much it. Um, it seems like a lot of internal conversations and not any big new shifts, I guess. So that was, uh, Scott couldn't make, he, Scott's on vacation. Good for him. Um, so he, I'm glad he sent us that email as, as the update. And I, I can't answer any of those questions. So <laughs> if you have questions, you can direct them to Scott, please. Any of the rest of you on the, you know, policy front or active at the state house, Rupert? I don't know if you might have anything to, to add or anyone else. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're standing by on that one and hope that it moves ahead. Uh, know that you know all the all the action, um, everything moves over the next uh, between over the course of our next two meetings. 
Uh, well, we can move into partner updates then. Um, we have a new partner. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, hi, John Mitchell. Welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself to the group and kind of say hi? Um, Jen West um, connected you to us, so the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, my name is John Mitchell. I just started working at uh, Narragansett Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with uh, that. And um, Robin Weber had the role formally. Um, and she's still around, which is great. Uh, so she's been a great resource for me. Uh, as you probably know, we've got uh, a lot of property out here and a lot of woodland. And um, so I'm just uh, here to learn and contribute um, both to help manage the property that we have. And also um, we're looking to be a resource for others um, for uh, how things are managed, um, trial site and things like that. So um, Chris, I'll certainly be reaching out to you um, for that tool that you had talked about and, and seeing um, how we can also offer feedback and um, resources for others. John, are you in this, uh, this stewardship manager for the reserve? Yes, probably, yeah, I could have said that. Yeah, I'm the stewardship coordinator, so um, that is a little bit of everything. Um, but primarily the title indicates that I'm helping to steward um, a lot of the properties, but it's, um, I think using that stewardship, not just to manage the properties, but manage it the tools and techniques that can be applied elsewhere too, I think is a big part of what we're looking to do. Thanks. Good to have you here. Um, Thanks, you good to be uh, here. Join us for more Woodland Mark partnership meetings. Uh, Definitely. All right, we'll just, you know, go go around uh, and, uh, you know, call on people and, and you can offer an update uh, if you have one or pass. Um, Patrick, how about you down in the Southern District? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, everything is going pretty well. Um, I just started full time with the district, so I'm busy writing farm plans. Um, and in the most recent plan that I'm working on, um, I'm actually recommending a forest management plan. So all, all of this has been uh, very helpful. Um, other than that, um, I've been helping my supervisor, Gina Fuller, um, with uh, some uh, just office help um, on the uh, um, dam removal project uh, for the um, Pawtuck River. So right now we're working on just collecting survey data and um, we're gonna present that to uh, the public in a public meeting that's coming up in a, about a month here. So that's about all I have. Great, thanks. Larry, would you like to give an update from Audubon? And also do a brief introduction so that John, everyone, John gets to know who you are. <laughs> okay, Hi. good idea. I'm Larry Taft. I'm Audubon Society of Rhode Island's executive director. Meg's boss, or except that Meg is leaving in June, just as we're losing Rupert. And uh, luckily, Kate's just jumping from one window to the other in this uh, Brady Bunch kind of thing here. Congratulations, Kate. Um, a couple of big things going on is, of course, there's a search on for a new person to fill Meg's shoes. The position is Senior Director for Government Affairs. <clears throat> we are in the middle of, you know, we have a lot of candidates that we're going through and we're, we hope to have that job filled um, perhaps in July. And then another second thing is uh, Audubon is going to, has created a new position of Director of Avian Research uh, to kind of follow up with the breeding bird atlas work and looking at just how migratory birds are utilizing Rhode Island's forests. You know, should we be managing for scarlet tanagers today or for summer tanagers for 30 years from now? Um, you know, uh, we're really kind of looking at the management of our forests. So um, we're also in that recruiting process as well. Very interesting candidate. So I probably have some more news for you later on in the summer when we finally have finalized that, but it is, uh, it's a, uh, it's pretty interesting. A lot of changes going on. And um, I guess that's kind of the highlight. Thanks, Larry. Some, some significant changes. Um, let's go over to David Gregg. Hi, uh, John, I'm David Gregg. I'm the director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. I think we, 
probably did uh, bio blitz together like 15 or some years ago so um, nice to have you uh, in the uh, at the research reserve that's awesome I, I know you'll be working with Tom Kutcher uh, on salt marsh stuff this summer so that's cool um, so the survey we're, we're still trying to figure out what kind of summer programs we're going to do this year um, we're kind of well, I'll work, uh, I'll work back into that from, from something else. Um, so we are tentatively planning to do a bio blitz in Cumberland at the Mercy Woods site on October 1st and 2nd. So this is kind of a mulligan from our attempt to do it uh, last year in June. And um, we haven't totally finalized everything yet. So, so you know, sort of don't, don't cancel a trip to Hawaii just on my say so. Um, wait a little bit till we finalize it. Um, but if you pencil it into your calendar, uh, that would be handy because then you would you would know then it was coming up. Um, and then we are also planning um, a natural history conference for November 18. That's Thursday, November 18th. Um, the subject is going to be on ecological restoration in Rhode Island. And um, we are kind of forging the call for papers for that right now. Um, and there'll be a save the date and a summary of kind of the themes. And we'll so be thinking about uh, papers that, or posters or sessions that you might want to suggest to us. That'd be really helpful. Um, over the course of the summer, we'll, we'll be hammering that out. Um, and uh, so then working backwards, this summer, we're trying to think about how we could um, focus um, some attention on ecological restorations of different types around the state in, through a series of either public programs or more of our YouTube videos. So I, I was recently talking to Tim Mooney about, you know, could what kind of walk could we lead at the um, pitch pine restoration at Tillinghast where, you know, we could go and look at that and you know, could we go to a dam removal and show people what that looks like somehow, or, or a salt marsh like a thin layer deposition? Could we go there and look and see, you know, what what's this all about? Um, and it would call attention to, to the idea that we're going to do a conference on ecological restoration in a few months. So, um, we haven't come to con any conclusions on that, um, but stay tuned. And um, if you have any. Uh, really cool restoration that you absolutely insist we come do one of our videos on, I'll be there. So let me know. Um, What's the update, David, on the Spadefoot Toad Pools? Uh, Spadefoot po spade Toad Pool, um, I understand that they filled with water and that the rye grass hatched and that they're off to the races. Now we just need toads. So, um, but these are, these are the pools in South Kingstown that um, that got put in in the land trust property off of Tucker Town Road. So, I my understanding is everything went as planned, and um, NRCS uh, helped us with the funds that we need. We're going to actually turn those funds around and um, hold them to use them as kind of front money for the next round of pools, which um, is tentatively going to take place in the fall, but might be next spring. I'm not sure yet. But um, stay tuned, working our way around the state with spadefoot toad pools. <laughs> That's it. Cool. Thanks, David. Glad you'll likely be able to get the bio blitz in. Uh, let's uh, just go right over to Amanda. Hi, uh, Amanda Freitas. I'm the Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan Community Liaison. That's a joint project with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey and the DEM Division of Fish and Wildlife. And um, what that essentially means is that I am um, tasked with trying to get the actions in the wildlife action plan on the ground um, through a lot of coordination work and um, no carrots and no sticks. So <laughs> um, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife just hired a non-game bird biologist. He was like a long time coming, so I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys or not, but he'll be on next week, John Herbert. Um, and so he's going to be covering, basically he's gonna be the non-game program other than the herpetologist and 
questionably me. Um, and his expertise is pretty broad, but it's all non-game birds. Um, so Larry, I don't know if you want to get in touch with, um, I guess they had a strong pool of candidates. So I don't know if you want to get in touch and see who they talk to, um, but you might be able to, to get some ideas <laughs> on candidates for your new position. Um, though ostensibly we took the best one from you. <laughs> um, so that's, that's our, um, staffing update. We seem to have a lot of them lately. Um, and then I mentioned that uh, I spoke at the NIAFA conference in late April. That symposium was on maladaptation to climate change. And so it was sort of, you know, we're all rushing to, um, to address climate change, but what are the, are we stopping to think about the impacts? Um, and obviously this was specific to wildlife. Um, but we had um, speaker, we had a speaker out of New Jersey talking about um, relevant to something that came up earlier, talking about um, some pretty savvy people putting up a lot of resistance to forest management, um, you know, concerns about taking down trees when we're worried about climate change. Um, I spoke about solar, primarily solar energy. Um, my counterpart spoke about marine energy, um, and he's He's a marine researcher, so he was primarily under the water. Um, but that, at least a synopsis of that, which was hosted by the Northeast um, Climate Change Adaptation Science Center, which is sort of like the USGS equivalent of NIACS, um, which most of you are familiar with, the um, Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science over the Forest Service. Um, so that's NECASC is a group that um, there are a bunch of scientists really interested in applied science. So they try not to do things that aren't um, partner driven and that won't, there won't be a use for the science at the end. Um, so they're a really great group to be in contact with. Um, there, Michelle Staudinger, who was the um, facilitator, is going to put together a synopsis of that. And um, I was pressed enough for time preparing the presentation that I did what you're not supposed to do, which is to have like my entire talk in the notes. So if anyone's interested, you could pretty much, I could pretty much share the whole thing with you soup to nuts because um, I did it the way you're not supposed to do it, which might benefit um, anyone who wants to know and wasn't there. Um, related to that, the Northeast is pulling together um, we're trying to pull together a grant to um, start to get into the impacts from renewable energy, what we know, what we don't know, what the needs are, um, with the intent that there would probably be a white paper. Um, the priorities and concerns across the Northeast are astounding. This is, when I say Northeast, this particular group is Maine to West Virginia um, and over to Pennsylvania and New York. Um, so it's a broad group and, um, you know, like we're trying to get um, solar into landfills and New Jersey saying like that's the last of our teeny grassland bird habitat. Um, so it's it really runs the gamut and I don't know what that's going to look like, but um, it is definitely coming up over and over again as a huge priority um, and it it will move in some form or another. I just don't know what that looks like yet. Um, I participate on the um, Northeast Climate Check Climate Change Adaptation Working Group, also um, spearheaded by NECASC. And um, yesterday we listened to a speaker who I've, I've been admiring while <laughs> preparing presentations and trying to figure out what to do. Um, his name is Steve Grodsky and he's co-founder of Wild Energy, um, which I encourage you to check out. Um, and the exciting thing that I learned from him yesterday is that he's primarily been out of UC Davis and doing um, studies on like Mojave tortoise and things like that that aren't necessarily broadly applicable here, but they are about to open a um, wild energy Cornell branch that he will direct. And um, so he's going to be bringing a lot more research now to the Northeast on, um, you know, how these things play out in the field and what the impacts are. So um, it can't come soon enough, but that's, to me, that's a really exciting um, development. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Let's see. Um, so, Paul Roselli, wearing your Burrowville Land Trust hat, um, what updates may you have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of updates. Uh, Paul Roselli, Burrowville Land Trust. We're a private nonprofit land trust in the town of Burrowville. We own about 230 acres. We're looking to buy 
two, uh, we're working towards two acquisitions, two new ones, a 65 acre farmland and 150 acre uh, wetland forest land area that's, that's abutting right up against uh, existing uh, state owned property. Uh, if we get both of those, it'll double our land acquisition holdings. Uh, in total, uh, we're looking at about two and a half million dollars for those 217 acres or thereabouts. So uh, yeah, uh, one, one of the uh, items that has uh, 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 come up, uh, we we're about to uh, announce a $100,000 gift uh, for that acquisition on what, what's, what's, what we've been calling Sweets Hill, that 150 acres. Uh, so $100,000 is nothing to sneeze at. So that's a big deal. But we still haven't gotten the confirmation letter yet. Went to the, went to the post office today. It's not there. So uh, we're hoping that once we get that, uh, we'll be able to leverage that and get other funders to sign on. We're also actively involved, and I, I forgot to mention this during my update, with the Biden administration's uh, 30 by 30 plan. And, I'm, and I do mean actively involved. Uh, we, we've been reaching out to all of our state uh, reps, Senate and House side, uh, as many people as we can to at least let them know that we have, quote unquote, two shovel ready projects all, all, already that we could buy tomorrow tomorrow. Actually, we can buy them this afternoon. Uh, there's still time. So we, we could buy them right now if, uh, if we had the money. Uh, the other uh, update is, and I invite you to this because it involves beer. Yep, beer. Remember that, that four letter word that we haven't been able to go out and have one, at least not legally or health, health wise. But we'll be, we'll be opening up, we're going to be officially opening up one of our trails uh, with a new sign, new uh, uh, markers, uh, maintenant. We've maintained, we've uh, uh, fixed it so it actually looks like a walking trail. Uh, and uh, immediately after that uh, guided tour from uh, myself and whoever else shows up, uh, we'll be going out to our local uh, craft brewery and having a, uh, a, an adult beverage or two. That's gonna happen in the middle of June. And I hope to let everybody know because it's gonna be a big deal for all of us. That's our update. Thank you. Excellent. Sounds refreshing, Paul. Thank you. Uh, let's go over the DEM contingent. Uh, why don't we start with Nancy? Nancy, are you... Um, there would like you like to give an yes, update? Yes, yes, oh. I'm I'm here. It just takes I don't know. It sure. takes a while to find that unmute button. Um, I'll let Fern talk about her program. Uh, just a couple updates with the FEMC program because I don't see Alani here today. Um, they've uh, they've been setting up the data rescue sprint project, so getting that um, verbiage in place. There are some issues with FEMC budget this year. Um, just in uh, making their match and things, but hopefully that will go ahead. And the health monitoring plots are planned for, you know, if everything else goes smoothly in other states is the end of June, start of July. So we'll get those seven plots um, started at that point. And they do have a question, so I'm just gonna throw it out there. Um, their people are camping um, and, and looking for uh, campsites or camp locations that they could get at low cost. Um, I don't really have access with the demand on the parks, but uh, if anybody knows of anywhere that, that could be likely, um, would love to hear about it so we can throw it out there. They're just looking to keep their costs low. Um, we have uh, Forest Health, Paul um, Ricard's program. Um, he's going to be putting, uh, every year he distributes to all the campgrounds some information on don't move firewood and some of those materials. There is a website out there called Firewood Scout and states can sign up and vendors can um, uh, set up so that 
people looking for firewood can click on the map and see where there's firewood being sold around the state. There are some costs involved, but um, I'm just looking for any ideas on how to uh, find some interest by um, people. A lot of them are just, uh, you know, gate sales and that kind of thing, pretty small scale stuff. Um, but uh, just if anybody's got any ideas on how to reach out, I've got an email at Mark Tremblay for his members. But uh, if uh, if you have any sense, I mean, it might be something as like uh, we create a flyer, and if you if you know and you drive by <laughs> two or three of those every every day, then you could drop one off in their firewood and see if we could get some nibbles. It would just be nice to have Rhode Island on the map. Um, so that's just something that's uh, in our minds. Um, been a busy fire season so far. So we just had recently, we had a 52 acre fire over on the east side. We've got uh, 26 acres that just got put out. So those are a little bigger fires than uh, we usually get. So, um, so exciting times. And as far as uh, Prudence Island, John, I don't know if Robin's talked about the uh, uh, prescribed fire and stuff that happened there. So if um, that's kind of up your alley and you'd like to get involved in that, um, you know, there's probably training opportunities and things like that to, uh, to get engaged with. So, and other than that, it's just um, a pleasure as always to work with Kate and uh, looking forward to uh, working my way through this very complicated concept of RCPP. She really did write the entire grant because this is beyond, <laughs> Beyond my experience, but we've got some good ideas floating around on how to, um, for the technical assistance, the enhancement and outreach part. So looking forward to coming up with some ideas and, and seeing what, um, how everybody can be engaged. Thanks, Nancy. Nancy. Yeah. Uh, would you be the one for me to reach out to regarding prescribed burning, either more information about that on prudence and trainings and things like that? Um, it would be only night, but if you, um, uh, uh, and Robin would have that information if you're in daily contact with her. So just yep. let her know and, and see what you guys can set up. Cause I know we're, we're looking at doing some expansion. We want to do some training. We want to do some different things. Um, we've got a firewise program. So that might be something that, um, you could help, uh, tout on Prudence Island kind of thing. So we've got a few things we're trying to Get out there so yeah um oni's the person but robin has that rather than reading off an email to you right now good stuff why don't we move over to fern hi so john and i already met hi john hello again i um have been talking for it feels like ages about my program getting more funding and we finally do. So now our base funding is $100,000 rather than $60,000, which is an amazing boost. And it will hopefully really expand what we're able to do with it. Um, we are still in discussion about exactly what's gonna happen with that funding. But as soon as we have some solid plans you will all know about it. Some of you may know about it earlier because we are calling people to get certain uh, inputs and structures put on the ground. So it's just really exciting. I'm really excited. And that's 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 my update for my program. Congrats, for that funding is hard one. Awesome. You know, it's Can serious you... when Fern gets excited about it. It's real. <laughs> Out. So and with that, that's a good thing. We'll, uh, that's a good thing. We'll go over to Cindy. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome, John. Um, I am Cynthia Kolick. I work for um, DEM's Agriculture Division. Um, I run the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Program. So uh, my main job is to monitor the state for exotic um, agricultural pests that are in forest pests that um, we don't have currently, but are a threat to our state. Um, so that's my main job. Um, so some program updates. Uh, we are starting our trap set up next week. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, it's nice to get out in the field um, <laughs> and actually 
breathe fresh air and not be stuck in, in the house all the time. Um, uh, one huge update is I was lucky enough to get my hands on some spotted lanternfly traps. Um, so I'm going to be trapping for a spotted lanternfly. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Usually um, it's seeds that actually have spotted lanternfly that have been able to get these traps in the past. Um, USDA was going to do some monitoring, but because Connecticut had a find, they're kind of preoccupied with that and Massachusetts had a live find as well. So I was able to get their trapping sites that they were planning on trapping to make sure Rhode Island is still covered. Um, so the sites aren't really like forested areas, um, except we do have one in Lincoln Woods um, because of the proximity to 146 and the fact they have Tree of Heaven. But most of our sites, because we're looking for Tree of Heaven, are urban. Um, so we are looking at some sites in Providence, Pawtucket, uh, the Quonset area where the trail, the rails go through, there's um, a lot of tree heaven. So hopefully we don't find anything this year, but um, I'll feel a little bit more confident to say that we haven't found anything if I've got traps out and more survey sites. So hopefully, knock on wood, we don't find anything. Um, other than that, no real big updates for us, just getting ready to set some traps. Cindy, what would the traps look like if we came across one? I'd be familiar with the EAB EAB ones or other traps. So our spotted lantern fly traps aren't really like any other trap that I've ever set up. Um, so they have like this wooden frame base with like a netting that kind of looks like a cloth screen material. And the goal is you put it on the side of the tree and then the spotted lantern fly has this natural instinct to crawl up. So it will be crawling up the tree um, into this netting. And then we have a bag placed at the very top with a pesticide strip and lure. So ultimately it's going to be going after the lure, but it's also like a behavioral trap because it's more incorporating their crawling, uh, climbing, like trying to go as high as they can in a tree thing. Um, so that's like the best description. It's like a wooden frame with like a bag on the top that they'll be like crawling into. So I also purchased some bug barriers, which are like, um, most people have seen those. They, for like gypsy moth, they go around the tree. Um, they're like a sticky tape. I got some that have like a, kind of like an outer edge to like avoid catching birds. Um, so I'm happy to use those. I think they're gonna be better than the regular bug barriers people use because we hopefully won't catch any birds or squirrels or bycatch, um, but they do also target that up crawling behavior of nymphs and adults. So hopefully I'll set a few of those up at some lower risk areas and I can hopefully confidently say at the end of the year that we don't have it, but I can't promise that because it is moving. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Interesting, learn about that, thanks. Yep, thank you. Why don't we go on over to Rupert? Hi everyone, Rupert Friday, Rhode Island Land Trust Council. John, uh, good to meet you. Um, so we have a workshop happening this evening for uh, to help land trusts identify properties where uh, they can protect areas to allow marshes to migrate inland. Uh, Mike Bradley at URI is doing that workshop for us. So, so John, it might be perfect for you out there in Prudence although you have a lot of protected land for marshes to migrate out there already. Um, and the other thing we are about to roll out is uh, RI Walks Challenge. We have uh, 30 nature inspired creatures that the steel yard is cut into uh, steel sheets and then powder coated and we're putting them on trees on the, the far ends of trails so that people have to go out walking to find them. Uh, and we're installing them right now around the state. Uh, we're gonna install one in one of Paul's trees out there in Burrowville soon. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully you get this launched. Um, it's taken longer to get them installed than we thought. So probably it'll be right after Labor Day, uh, I mean Memorial Day when we, uh, when we go public with uh, uh, marketing for it, so. We're getting the skunk cabbage. <laughs> That's a nice one. That's a cool one. 
And I think everybody knows. Um, so my board of directors has hired my successor who is also on the screen uh, and Kate. Uh, uh, so it's uh, really great to have, have somebody that knows Rhode Island, and knows, uh, knows a lot of the players, knows a lot of you. Uh, and I think she's, uh, she's going to take things to the next, next level. It's been uh, uh, working with her on this uh, RCPP proposal and watching the work with the, the Woodland Partnership on the forest plan and then working with her on the uh, connecting uh, Southside Community Land Trust, connecting farmers with uh, farmland. Uh, I've gotten to know her three or four different projects and it's, it's been great. So, uh, so I was excited when I heard that's who they hired. Thanks, Hi. Robert. <laughs> and uh, congratulations, Kate. I'd line you up next for um, in the update line. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I should, I'm still a Northern Conservation District and Rhode Island RCD employee. So I guess I will give those um, updates first. Uh, Rupert, thank you so much. I'll, I'll send you another hat this afternoon. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to be losing an awful lot of hats, I think, which I, it might be, um, it's a good thing. I will be keeping this Rhode Island Woodland Partnership uh, co-coordinator hat, though. John, nice to meet you. Um, currently work for the Northern Rhode Island Conservation District, and I am the forestry for Rhode, Rhode Island Birds Coordinator for the Rhode Island Resource Conservation and Development Council. I'll give those updates first. So um, Paul was on earlier. It looks like he had to hop off, but the coverts program is happening on this Saturday. Um, so just flagged and plugged for that. Uh, you have to register if you're interested in going. It should be a nice full day. And at coverts, I'll be giving my plug for our Forestry for the Birds field tours this summer. So um, our first program is coming up in two weeks at RIFCO. Uh, at the demonstration woodlot. So we're going to be um, walking the property with Scott Ruren and with our RIFCO um, partners to take a look around and see uh, what sort of birds we're seeing and what sort of management activities were done. Um, next, we are going to be at Norman Bird on June 15th at 5 p.m. Uh, to do the same thing. And Laura Carberry will be joining us and we'll be at Tom Bryson's private woodlot on Monday, June 21st at 8, 8, 8.30 in the morning, which is kind of a, uh, it's a different time for us to have a workshop, but it, we will guarantee that there might be some bird activity to actually see, um, which is, I know that the Bryson's are excited about that part. Um, we do have the, t the technical service provider, natural resources professional, um, sorry, workshop on the docket Coming up, uh, I believe Chris Modisett and Gary Casabona and Paul are gonna work on coordinating that um, as I will have moved on at that point. Um, I encourage all of you to go. That's sort of a workshop um, to better understand why we're um, looking towards these uh, management practices for uh, forest birds and how to encourage those in woodlots overall, include those in forest management plans. Um, so I wanna keep Forest Legacy on everyone's radar. Uh, Greg has not officially retired. I know he's moving, Greg Cassidy's moving in that direction. Um, I, Rich Blodgett and I have been in touch to ensure that we are keeping Forest Legacy on the forefront. And then the, the project that's already funded, we wanna make sure that those properties are permanently conserved. So um, just flagging this here, uh, we're hoping to set a meeting in the next couple of weeks to at least put this on the forefront at DEMs to say, we need a, we need a new coordinator. We need to ensure that these deals are gonna get done. Um, what do you need from us? And I know that Greg and Rich uh, are gonna start coordinating another uh, workshop to solicit more applications. So we have another phase two application ready to go for that. Um, we do have, I think, eight applications that were not funded in the last round. So in addition to those eight, we're looking for more properties in the situate reservoir watershed. Um, 
Southern New England Heritage Forest in Rhode Island is cruising along. We've got Scott and Laura starting their bird surveys. Laura's first one was yesterday. Uh, we have nine this season. And they, just to recap, um, Scott Ruren and Laura Carberry from Audubon go to private woodlot owners' properties. They do a full habitat assessment and a bird survey. They write a plan um, and make suggestions for forest management activities based on the birds and the habitat of those sites. And then the forester incorporates those into uh, either a fresh forest management plan or adds it as an amendment. So we are underway with that. We have two um, conservation stewardship program contracts where uh, NRCS is now offering forestry for the birds as a CSP um, option. So we have two contracts and I'm trying to sort out with Scott contracting and how to get the landowners on board with that. So hopefully those bird surveys will be done this spring as well. I uh, gave you all the update on the RCPP um, and on July 6th, I am officially um, taking over for Rupert, which is just going to be a monumental task. Those are, you have giant shoes to fill um, and I'm really excited to start that work. I will still be here <laughs> um, on the Woodland Partnership and there will be some crossover um, with the work that I've been doing in my, my new role. So I'm ex it doesn't mess up the RCPP. I'm just able to shift like over. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. So that's a lot for me, but I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. All those updates, um, typical, show how you rake in thick things. Um, so my name is uh, Christopher Riley. I'm the uh, co-coordinator of the Woodland Partnership. Um, I have two primary hats uh, working for the University of Rhode Island, um, largely supporting um, Rhode Island NRCS's forestry program. I do, I do some other things as well there. Um, I'll give you an update on in a moment. Uh, and then I also have my um, independent practice, uh, Sweet Birch Consulting, uh, working on forestry uh, and conservation projects. So uh, in terms of updates, uh, with URI, the uh, Climate Adaptive Forestry uh, McIntyre Stennis Grant uh, project that I talked about, uh, we received an informal word that that is going to be funded for the full three years that we requested. So that's, that's exciting. Um, uh, Understand that the you know official letter or whatever you know might have to wait until September for that, but it's it's essentially a go. But that's going to um, extend um, a research project that UConn has, has started with a couple of sites in in Connecticut to include a site in Rhode Island at the Decapit uh, Preserve down in southern Rhode Island with uh, three different climate adaptive forestry treatments. Uh, the resistance, resilience, and transition, uh, along with a no-cut control area, along with development of training and outreach materials you know, for foresters and professionals, and then landowners and land trusts as well. So we'll be sort of following the uh, foresters for the birds model there. So I uh, look forward to um, being involved with many of you on that project. And just to pass, pass along too, that um, Bill Buffum has now uh, officially retired you know, from URI and I've sort of taken on his role while he's, he's still very much around and has in fact you know, taken on a, a part-time role you know, working with NRCS and the Wildlife Management Institute on um, early successional habitat projects. Um, but I'm gonna be managing the Rhode Island uh, Woods website, um, taking over for Bill on that, and you know, with a bit of the, the funding that, that comes along with that, uh, perhaps this is going to be the opportunity to uh, expand the Woodland Partnership's um, presence from that one page to more of something like an actual website, which we've been talking about for some time. Uh, but I'm excited about that. We can we can talk about that at uh, future Woodland Partnership meetings. So those are my updates. Um, the, please, the, please pass the congratulations along to Bill Buffum and Larry. If you could wish Meg well as well, uh, 
was hoping we would be able to wish her well in this setting, but pass it along. All right, will do. Yes, indeed. And welcome, John. Uh, Nibner staff are actually <clears throat> Audubon staff through a state contract. So welcome aboard, John. Nice to meet you. <laughs> indeed. So our, um, you know, for our next, you know, Woodland Partnership meeting, I think we're going we're to go back to the stand, standard, you know, third Thursday that we, we, we usually do, which would, I guess, to June 17th. Uh, if there's anyone who would um, like to bring a focal topic, you know, which they, you know, talk about at the meeting, you know, as, as we often do, um, you know, we'd welcome uh, any anybody who's interested in doing that. And then just to, you know, put the idea in your mind after, you know, all this time, you know, being on, on Zoom and with, if things can, you know, continue to start uh, opening up, we'd previously been pretty successful having a couple of, you know, outdoor summer, you know, Woodland Partnership um, meeting type walks. And I think that would be, you know, good for, you know, morale and, you know, re reconvening. Uh, assuming that we're able to do that safely. Uh, so um, if, if any of you have a, a site in mind or, or a, you know, would, would like to possibly host, um, that's, that's something to think about too as we head into the summer months. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to me and Kate. Anybody have any other updates or things that they'd like to talk about? All right, well, um, good solid meeting today. Lots to talk about. Thanks to all of you for staying through the entire meeting. Um, hope you have a good afternoon and look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Hi, everybody. Good to have you with us, John.